Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so uh, I, I will uh, present something on randomized control experiments in economics and ask the question if is it in the new panacea for fighting uh, poverty? Uh, this is a special viewpoint uh, because I'm not a randomista. Uh, I don't know everything about uh, a randomized control uh, trial. I'm an institutional economist interested in uh, the pharmaceutical industry as well as uh, development economics and socio-economy and in uh, history of economic thought and uh, epistemological issue. So I will try to, to build a kind of uh, constructive critique uh, in order to uh, contextualize uh, the emergence and the success of uh, randomized control trials in economics and uh, beyond. Um, Besides, you, you have a, a really an easy access to uh, the, the uh, original uh, randomista uh, Vista. Just go to the JPAL uh, website and you have a wealth of videos, uh, policy briefs, uh, articles and so on. Uh, so, um, I just spoke of the JPAL, the Jamil Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab which is situated uh, at uh, the MIT. There are uh, 131 affiliated professors, almost 700 ongoing or completed uh, evaluation in uh, 68 countries, and uh, they are rising star in, in the JPAL. Uh, out of the six, six last clock uh, medal recipients, four are JPOL members. So that's, that's a performance. Uh, there is, oh, you can't see it really <laughs> good. There is a boom of uh, RCT in the tropics and also in the north now. Uh, it reached more than 200 million people and uh, in many countries and uh, there are many people trained uh, by uh, the JPOL, several thousands of uh, scientists and uh, researchers. Uh, so I will focus on, on uh, the JPAL because it is the biggest lab in the world now uh, dealing with poverty and development issues and promoting our cities both in the south and in the north. Uh, so I will analyze how uh, our cities are practiced by this very organization especially by its leading uh, figure, uh, Duflo, but have to emphasize that other uses of our cities exist. And I, I will come back to that uh, shortly in the concluding remarks. So there is a, a very strong uh, caveat. Uh, this presentation is not about our cities in general. It is only about a specific use of our cities. So the main point uh, of the presentation, in the first part, uh, I will define uh, what our cities are. I will um, deal with their claim of scientificity and uh, impartiality. In the second part, uh, I will uh, describe some uh, limits that uh, arise in the practice of uh, uh, RCT, and I will try to show you why it is not a panacea. And uh, in the third part, uh, I will um, put our cities uh, into context, into the immediate historical uh, context to explain the current success of our cities. And in the longer historical context, uh, I, I will show you that there are, since the beginning of the 20th century, experimental cycle uh, in social sciences and policy. So it is not new. Uh, I will try to show you that. Uh, what do and in the last part, uh, I will um, uh, ask what does it tell us about the uh, current state of uh, economics? So first, what are SETs? I will begin with a short definition. I will exemplify that uh, 
uh, with two RCTs. I will show you that they focus on micro devices for uh, development and I will uh, describe their pledge of uh, scientificity, the expected advantages of uh, RCTs. So what is it? It is a kind of uh, with versus without comparison. Uh, you will compare two groups uh, that are similar. Uh, the only difference between the two groups is that one group receives the intervention and one doesn't. So uh, it is a social experiment where some uh, units, some groups are randomly assigned to an intervention while uh, the rest form the control group and then uh, average outcomes of the two groups are uh, compared. So there are three key ingredients. Uh, the uh, randomization ingredient, it guarantees that the groups are uh, similar regarding uh, observable as well as uh, non-observable variables. Uh, it is a control experiment uh, using uh, treatment groups and control groups and it is an impact evaluation. Uh, it measure, measures the impact of a special action intervention development uh, program. So uh, let's begin with uh, the um, most paradigmatic example uh, uh, by uh, the JEPAL, um, the flagship experiment on worms. Um, why worms? Um, intestinal worms, different kind of uh, intestinal uh, worms, infect more than one quarter of the world's population. And uh, they are believed to have a negative impact on education, hindering child development as well as school attendance and reducing income later in life. So uh, Miguel and uh, Kremer evaluated a mass school-based deworming, deworming program in western Kenya, in the Bujia district, which is, which is uh, the main base uh, of the JPL. It is a poor and densely settled farming region in western Kenya, uh, adjacent to Lake Victoria. Um, so uh, the program randomly divided 75 schools into three old groups of 25 schools, which were phased into treatment uh, over three years. So uh, group one school receives uh, free deworming treatment uh, all the time. Group two uh, schools uh, began the treatment the next year and group three uh, two years after that. So uh, group one schools were uh, first treatment schools uh, in the first year, while group two and group three were uh, comparison control schools, and it changed in uh, the following year. So there was a total uh, enrollment of uh, over uh, 30,000 pupils between age uh, 6 to 18, so it is a huge experiment, and uh, within each group, uh, a baseline uh, parasit uh, parasitological survey uh, was administered to a random sample of uh, pupils. And schools with uh, worm prevalence over 50% were mass treated uh, with uh, deworming drugs every six months. So you just have to take one pill uh, every six months. It's uh, uh, kind of easy treatment. Uh, so what was the impact? Uh, deworming uh, increased school participation by at least seven percentage points, which is equivalent to a one quarter reduction in school absenteeism. There were also interesting uh, treatments spillover uh, to uh, the deworming treatments. Um, there are externalities to these treatments. Uh, because medical treatment reduces the transmission of infections to uh, other community uh, member. So uh, there was uh, uh, this externality uh, where uh, tw 23 percentage points uh, lower on average. And besides, uh, this treatment is really 
uh, cost effective, it only cost uh, three uh, point uh, of almost four dollars per year, uh, and uh, it makes deworming uh, very cost effective in comparison to uh, alternative methods of increasing uh, school participations. Uh, another interesting example is the Al Amana microcredit experiment. Um, Al Amana is uh, Morocco's biggest microfinance uh, institution. Uh, it was mainly active in uh, urban areas and uh, it tried uh, to uh, develop uh, its activities in order to include uh, remote. Uh, rural uh, areas uh, in uh, Atlas regions, for, uh, for instance, all over Morocco. So the study sought to uh, measure uh, microcredits impact on households level of income and uh, uh, consumption expenditure, among uh, other things. Uh, the study was meant to fill a large knowledge gap uh, and it was described uh, by the JPAL as the first robust impact evaluation uh, of microcredit in rural areas. Uh, so how did it work? 81% uh, of March village were selected, uh, selected all over Morocco to provide a representativity of results on a national scale. So it was based on a selection of a pair of similar village on the same site. Each site included roughly 10 villages uh, that were uh, covered by uh, newly implanted alamina units. And in each pair, the first randomly selected village uh, had uh, immediate access to uh, microfinance, whereas the second village uh, was a, a control uh, village for two years. years. So uh, almost uh, 6,000 households were surveyed on two occasions before the experiment and uh, two years after the beginning of the experiment. Uh, there were unexpected uh, difficulties. Um, the expected take-up rate of uh, uh, 60%, uh, which was uh, current in uh, urban areas, uh, didn't uh, take place. Uh, the uh, take-up rate was about 10% uh, according uh, to the survey data. And the study uh, showed uh, finally that given the sample size and take-up rates, no impact could be found on poverty, consumption, activity uh, diversification or shock absorption. However, there were some uh, significant effects on uh, production and wages uh, uh, among some households. I will tell you uh, more about this experiment, uh, its vicissitude and uh, interpretation uh, later. We'll come back to that. Uh, so, RCT are uh, basically the evaluation of micro, micro devices and thus they instill a welcome concreteness into mainstream development economics. They are dealing with very concrete uh, empirical issues. It is a kind of small issue approach. You compare the distribution of school books to the dis free distribution of uniforms, warming pills and so on. There are many ways uh, to foster education with uh, different uh, results. And uh, it is uh, quite different from uh, standard neoclassical theory. Uh, take, for instance, endogenous growth theory, uh, which analyzes general uh, relationship, for instance, between education and growth. Uh, so it's kind of big issue uh, approach uh, at the macro level. Um, so they focus on day-to-day -day microstructure and they show that uh, this uh, matter a lot. Um, what are uh, the uh, expected uh, advantages uh, of this method? Um, Duflo explained that it allows to move from uh, correlation, which is not causality, to the isolation of a pure causal effect. 
and uh, thus she critiques uh, cross-country growth regressions uh, that are not uh, scientific enough uh, for her. Um, she also emphasized that RCTs are real-life in vivo experiments compared to laboratory experiments. Uh, laboratory experiments uh, uh, are um, dealing with a uh, very controlled condition, but uh, this condition are often very unrealistic or very artificial, taking place, for instance, in school rooms with students, so it's not real life and real life actors. Um, it is also dealing with uh, the selection bias, uh, difference between groups that uh, may interact with the independent variable and that thus be responsible for uh, the observed outcome. And uh, they are uh, addressing effectively uh, the attribution problem, uh, that is to what extent changes in outcomes of interest can be attributed to a particular intervention. So it solves lots of problems in all the uh, comparable methods, uh, be it natural experiments, uh, etc. Uh, and uh, furthermore, what uh, Duflo underlines uh, is that there is a, uh, a, s a simplicity in the interpretation of uh, results. You, you, look, you just have to look at, to, to compare the, the mean effect. And it is uh, very easy to communicate on uh, the results of the uh, experiment. I will nuance that later, uh, as we, we shall see. Um, and uh, thus, Orsetti uh, should be able to revolutionize social sciences and evaluation. And uh, they have a strong legitimacy transferred from uh, medicine, uh, from evidence-based medicine to evidence-based policy. And uh, Duflo and Kremer told that uh, uh, randomized trials for uh, pharmaceuticals revolutionize medicine in the 20th century, and so will uh, social randomized uh, control experiment during uh, the 21st uh, century. And they present uh, RCT as a kind of gold standard, uh, uh, like uh, uh, the best method ever in social sciences and uh, evaluation. Um, they are looking for uh, hard numbers and they're trying to find global poverty uh, with hard numbers, that's uh, uh, the title of an interview with uh, leading uh, JPAL members, uh, which is echoing uh, uh, JPAL founder Apijit Banerjee. Uh, he emphasizes the hard evidence produced by RCT and he opposes it to the so called wishy washy evidence of cross country growth regression and even with uh, case studies. Case studies is really soft methodology, it's kind of bad, uh, poor anecdotal evidence. So uh, uh, the randomista is presented as a neutral and uh, impartial scientist, uh, the spearhead of the credibility revolution in the empirical economics. Uh, and RCT is uh, uh, an objective technique allowing to settle ideological debates by a kind of experimentum crucis or uh, by series of experiments. And uh, for Duflo, RCTs are quite compelling. She uh, fully denies the interpretative role of uh, the scientist. For her, there is no room for interpretation, either it works or not. If it doesn't work, one can only try something else. So, uh, a true scientist is bias-free, ideology-free, he follows the verdict of the data, and thus it solves the free eyes problem. Ideology, ignorance, inertia. So, that's the claim. Now, let's see what are our cities in practice, and we will see that uh, there are uh, many practical uh, limits for uh, RCTs. So in this part, uh, I, I will show you that there is a, a bounded uh, uh, evidence and relevance in, in practice. 
Uh, there are numerous threats to internal as well as uh, external validity. I will define it uh, later. Uh, it is only uh, an evidence of effectiveness, not of uh, causality. And there are missing links uh, in interpreting and theorizing RCTs. And uh, then I will try to, to tackle the uh, issue of relevance. RCTs for whom and for which type of action. So uh, what is internal uh, validity? It is the extent to which a study minimizes uh, systematic error or bias and all cities are uh, reputed uh, to have the best internal validity. I will show you that it is uh, not always the case in, in practice. And uh, uh, so uh, a very good internal validity with a trade-off regarding uh, external validi validity, that is the extent to which the uh, results of a study can be generalized to other situations, to other people, uh, to uh, other periods uh, in time. And, uh, and there are numerous problems regarding external uh, validity. First, uh, one based ways are not always transferable from one context to uh, another. Let's take again the uh, worm uh, example. Uh, it is a simple uh, immediate uh, causal chain with a strong universal uh, physiological determinants. And even in this case, uh, the results cannot be simply extrapolated to other contexts. Uh, for instance, the worm in India had uh, results that were um, only 10 uh, to 12 percent of the returns to deworming in Kenya. So even in this case, you, can't, you cannot transfer it uh, simply. A and my thesis is, is that it is all the more uh, true, all the more crucial for experiments where social and cultural variables are crucial. Uh, replication of identical experiments regarding, for instance, parents' counsel in schools show quite opposite uh, results in Kenya and India. It worked in Kenya, but not in India. So contexts do matter. The problem is that it is not rigorously taken into account by Jepal. And uh, there are challenges uh, in scaling up. Um, randomized experiments are a nice tool uh, to isolate a pure effect of an action, but they do not grasp uh, the interaction between uh, multiple actions, between uh, different measures uh, in the same uh, program. And uh, in uh, pharmacology, it is a common wisdom that clinical studies do not take into account synergy effects between different drugs, and uh, it's especially relevant, for instance, for older people who will take lots of drugs. Uh, potentiation effect, uh, the action of one component intensify the action of the IT active principle of the drug and antagonistic effects between drugs that can annihilate, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the effect of the other drug. So uh, by uh, focusing on the micro foundations of the economy and by relying implicitly, implicitly on the idea of a representative agent, all cities do not grasp composition effects, uh, uh, which are sometimes called uh, gen general equilibrium effects um, between uh, micro, meso and uh, micro uh, levels. So what they try, uh, their motto is to multiply small solutions brick by brick uh, and this should lead to a quiet revolution solving incrementally global uh, poverty. That's what they say very strongly in the book Poor Economics. But as valuable as these small piecemeal solutions are, composition effects, meso and macroeconomics have to be put back uh, into the picture. Meso and macro issue have also a huge impact on the lives of the poor and do matter in development economics. Just think of the huge impact of uh, structural adjustment policies in uh, developing 
uh, country. Think of the evolutions of terms of trade, the uh, insertion in global uh, value chains. It plays a huge role. So it is a far cry from dewarming children to developing an entire nation like uh, China. China contributed, as you well know, uh, massively to the diminution of the world poverty in the last decades. But its development, as well as its misdevelopment, cannot be understood without putting industrial and macroeconomic policies, polycentric governance structures uh, in the pictures. And Mark will tell you a lot uh, more about that. Thus, all development issues cannot be solved by punctual treatments, even if these punctual treatments are, are scaled up, are applied to all countries. Uh, another issue uh, regarding external uh, validity is the time sensitivity of experiments. It is well known, uh, as far as clinical trials are concerned, that many effects appear only in the long run uh, when identified by uh, post-clinical studies after RCTs. Uh, the one of the main uh, journal, uh, medical journal, published uh, a, a study that uh, demonstrated that one in five new drug, drugs has unrecognized adverse drug reaction that do not show up until after the drug has been approved. And sustainable development is a matter of time too. Outcomes are often non-linear and vary uh, a lot across time. Experiment by the Japan showed, showed this problem. Uh, Microcredic experiment that uh, had uh, no results in the first year, but uh, in the second year uh, or in the third year. Uh, the same for uh, promotion of export-oriented crops in Kenya, where uh, the uh, uh, institutional matrix change uh, in Europe with a new norm uh, on imported products, for instance, uh, or uh, the rare RSI experiment in France. Uh, my point is that the, this time sensitivity is all the more crucial as actor learns, interact, and evolve over time, as well as the institutional matrix. And uh, this is the core of development processes, this evolution process. But because of their costs, most experiments are often limited to a short period. Two, three years is the mean uh, duration of uh, experiments. Uh, another problem is uh, social uh, variability. Um, our city are dealing with mean effect and they do not deal with heterogeneity of agents, of units, uh, within groups, uh, across groups, etc. Um, and uh, let's uh, take uh, the example of the, the uh, al amana uh, experiment. There was a very fascinating qualitative analysis uh, conducted alongside uh, this experiment on a subsample of the study villages and this study uh, explained why microcredit demand was highly heterogeneous among treatment regions and inside uh, regions. There is a huge diversity in Morocco of agroecological settings that have an impact on the uh, demand of uh, microcredit. Uh, there are multiple local meanings associated with credit and debts. Uh, for instance, uh, religious, uh, um, interdiction to uh, get indebted and so on. Uh, there is a, a variability of micro interaction with uh, a different credit officer which develop different techniques to enroll uh, clients and also local leaders that have a huge impact on the leaders. So the treatment is varying across uh, social relations, uh, uh, across uh, individuals, across groups. Uh, and so it is very difficult to interpret it. Um, another question is, is randomization really randomization? Uh, it is a problem in uh, medicine. Real world clinical experiments are repeatedly subject to uh, deviation from the ideal, from the textbook 
uh, randomization process. So, for instance, uh, there are many ways of uh, subverting randomization, deciphering our assignment sequence uh, by uh, going to the radiology department where there is a huge light and you, you, you have a look at the list of uh, the sequence. Uh, you search by night uh, in the office files of the principal investigator and so on. And uh, just uh, if you have seen Grey's Anatomies and other medical series, you have uh, many examples uh, that you can also find uh, in uh, real life of uh, deviation from the process. So um, it is the same in uh, social uh, our cities. Uh, um, local actors often refuse the very principle of randomization. Uh, it was the case in the flagship randomized experiment on worms. Uh, uh, it was reported by Angus Deaton. Uh, private communication with Kramer confirmed that the local partner didn't permit the use of uh, random numbers for assignments. So they use alphabetization. And alphabetization uh, doesn't guarantee orthogonality with potential confounders. It's a kind of quasi-experiment. So it is weird. It is presented as the flagship experiment, but it is not uh, using randomization. Uh, and there are other examples like that, uh, as far as uh, JPOL is concerned. Uh, besides, there are many practical hurdles to maintain the, the protocol. There are unintended social reactions like placebo and nocebo effects um, that are all the more important uh, than uh, there are uh, no uh, double-blind uh, process in uh, social experiments. Uh, there are uh, people who are diverting the program uh, from its objective. There are all kinds of social resistances. For instance, in France, it was the, the case with uh, the so-called cagnotte scolaire uh, in, uh, in Créteil, uh, where they were trying to, to, to pay uh, pupils to, to, to be present in school, and so there was a huge social resistance uh, to develop financial incentives. Um, there are many practical uh, difficulties uh, generating uh, statistical problems, among other the uh, attrition problem, which is very often the case. There are a uh, loss of participant, dropout, non-response, etc. And there are also permeability problems, contamination between treatment and control groups. People in the treatment group that don't receive the treatment and um, uh, in a treatment group and in control group, people who are able to get the treatment. So uh, it, it is an important problem. And it is also uh, very hard to maintain an homogeneous uh, design over time and regions. Um, uh, let's take again the Al-Amana example. Um, as mentioned, the take-up rate uh, was uh, much lower than expected. So many actions were uh, uh, undertaken to try to enhance it, uh, and the products feature, the treatments feature change. And normally for uh, 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 RCT to be valid, it has to be constant. It, it, does, it couldn't change. So, uh, for instance, uh, the initial cutters for women was removed because it didn't work at all. Uh, the uh, uh, repayment schedule was modified during the experiment. Um, uh, in the first period, credit was only provided for groups. Then some individuals in some locations were allowed to borrow individually to, to get the take-up rate higher. And also the enhanced information of uh, population. So uh, it is the evaluation of unstable uh, programs <coughs> then. And, uh, these uh, programs are become different from normal implementation condition. Uh, and sometimes it is so strong, uh, these problems are so strong that uh, a former GPOL uh, project manager uh, spoke of out of control experiment. When you are in the field, you are aware of that. Uh, another issue is the type of evidence uh, that is at stake. 
Um, in evidence-based medicine, there is a, a clear distinction between evidence of existence, that is the description and verification of facts to build an agreement among different actors on the state of the world, evidence of causality, where you have to explain the generating mechanism underlying the observed event, evidence of effectiveness, a given action yields the desired results, and evidence of harmlessness. Um, so uh, <coughs> randomized experiments evaluate the effectiveness of a special intervention, but they do not uh, uncover the underlying causal agencies. Except in one case, it's except in the very rare case of uh, linear causality where A produces B without uh, feedback from B to A. Uh, but in social sciences, complex multi-causality is uh, the rule. Uh, um, so um, in medicine, uh, for instance, there is clinical evidence that uh, acupuncture can prevent post-operative nausea and vomiting, but we just don't know why and how acupuncture work to produce this effect. So uh, the j uh, produces evidence of effectiveness, but in many cases there is a kind of ambiguity. Here. They argue as if it were an all-encompassing evidence uh, there is the ambiguity of the notion of causal effect, and um, you have to, uh, if one has to have in mind that many of their interpretation amounts to a kind of barroom philosophy, and uh, the, the measure of the effect is robust, but the interpretation uh, sometimes is not at all uh, robust. Um, uh, all cities are uh, not well suited to capture actors' motives, perceptions, the working of social interaction in norms, ambient contingent conditions, edest, uh, for me, crucial factors to understand causal mechanism in uh, social settings. Um, and to uncover this uh, causal mechanism, to understand why it worked or not, a theory is needed. Uh, Yet, Duflo has a narrow uh, understanding of a theory. She uh, uses, uh, she defines theory as proposition, uh, defining the uh, anticipated results, uh, results of experiments. So, randomized experiments uh, can thus contribute uh, effectively to the uh, invalidation of all its universal law. For instance, uh, in uh, supply-side economics and I mean uh, over, uh, where it is supposed that you have to buy a product to use it effectively. And uh, RCT by uh, Pascaline Dupas and others uh, showed very clearly that free access to medical devices does not reduce their use, just on the contrary. Uh, uh, it augments uh, their use and makes it more effective. So, uh, it contributes to, to t theory testing in an interesting way, but that's not enough. Uh, the relationship to uh, theory as a coherent set of principal device to explain a group of phenomena uh, is weak, uh, is uh, partial, especially uh, when uh, one has to explain why experiments yield uh, surprising results compared to expectations. Uh, Besides, there are very few theoretical references uh, in their work and conceptual reflection uh, is uh, rather poor. Uh, so it lacks really an articulate uh, theory of agents, cognitive processes, institutions, structures. There are some uh, behavioral effects like procrastination that are uh, dispersedly into that, but there is no systematic uh, theory. Um, and uh, interpreting the outcomes is not uh, so straightforward as uh, Duflo states. It is very often a tricky issue. Uh, let's take again uh, the Alamana experiment. Uh, the outcomes of the experiments were apparently uh, clear-cut. 
uh, the program just failed in rural uh, areas. Yet, uh, the qualitative study showed that the failure of the program was also linked to a real-time uh, calendar of repayment. Uh, the, the calendar of repayment wa was mimicking um, a calendar of repayments in urban areas. It was not adapted to uh, agriculture uh, timing. Uh, so it was a huge problem. So uh, an experiment tests the effect of a whole apparatus, even if this apparatus seems at first sight uh, straightforward. It corresponds, in fact, to a, co uh, a complex bundle of explicit as well as implicit assumptions. It is highly delicate to disentangle which one are at work to explain the observed outcomes. Uh, it is a well-known epistemological problem. It's called the uh, duem quine uh, problem. It is the impossibility to test a hypothesis in isolation. Uh, an empirical test of an hypothesis here does micro, uh, microcredit work to alleviate poverty requires one or more background or auxiliary assumption. Here, uh, the uh, auxiliary implicit assumption was that the calendar is causally neutral, which was not the case, in fact. So th it is really uh, not a straightforward uh, issue. Uh, and uh, to interpret the outcome, uh, I would say that there is a strong need for qualitative social analysis. Um, Again, um, Jepal interpreted uh, the outcomes of uh, Alamana experiment um, with uh, hard credit constraints that were supposed to cause low formal and informal usage of credit. The qualitative study challenges this. Uh, it shows the importance of social, cultural and political factors to explain the outcomes. For example, it showed that uh, households had very varied perception in terms of the use of credit and repayment obligation. Uh, as regards repayment uh, obligation, uh, the organization Al Amana was perceived in many regions as a government entity. And um, it had uh, many implications. In, in some regions, uh, credits were mostly understood as uh, state transfer, so you have, don't have to reimburse uh, to pay back uh, the credit. Or, uh, for instance, in the Reef region, which has a kind of rebel attitude toward uh, the central authorities, you know, the, uh, in the Reef region, that's uh, a region where uh, cannabis is grown and so on, huh? so many illegal activities, and people t were, were telling, uh, Oh, it is government's money, uh, government's officials are thieves, so we take the money and we steal from the thieves. Uh, so you see, it's not simple uh, to, to interpret it. So scrutinizing and theorizing the social context is crucial. And uh, it has to complement uh, our cities. Another issue is relevance. Uh, our cities for whom? Uh, in medicine, it is uh, a well-known issue. Um, often, uh, it is deplored that what is tested is what is uh, meaningful for big pharma profits and not for patients. Uh, in uh, development studies, uh, the question is, uh, are we testing what is meaningful for academics striving to maximize what GPL members call publishable units. Yeah. How many publishable units can we try if we uh, use, if we test this treatment, or with the other treatment, we can have more publishable units in uh, the top five uh, journals. So um, what is publishable is not always uh, meaningful for uh, the subject of uh, the experiments. Um, Another tricky issue is uh, the issue of surrogate endpoints. Uh, many medicines are approved to accelerate the process on the basis 
of uh, surrogate endpoints like proof that they lower uh, bad cholesterol rather than because they have been shown to reduce the risk of death or disease, which is the final endpoint, uh, which is the, uh, uh, the objective of the drug. And the problem is that several drugs approved this way have uh, recently uh, proved uh, ineffective and even uh, dangerous. Uh, and uh, a partisan of uh, um, our cities in medicine uh, warns that uh, reliance on surrogate outcomes sometimes has catastrophic uh, consequences. There were between, uh, for instance, 20,000 and 70,000 premature deaths every year in the United States alone uh, due to the fact that uh, drugs were tested um, uh, along uh, the surrogate endpoint that they were reducing uh, cardiac rhythm abnormalities, um, but they had these huge uh, damaging effects. And uh, it's the same uh, in uh, development studies. Uh, they, they focus on uh, surrogate endpoints, like, for instance, the increased use of fertilizer by farmers through various devices, because it's easy, easy to measure it, but there is no guarantee that we will reach the final endpoint. It is implicitly assumed that the use of fertilizer, the surrogate endpoint, is necessarily a development factor, the primary endpoint, via, via the augmentation of crop yields and the supposedly coupled increase of farmers' incomes. Yet there is no guarantee that this causal chain is always valid and universal. And no alternative like, uh, for instance, organic uh, cultural methods are discussed. So it can reduce uh, democracy and uh, the relevance of endpoints for the subject uh, uh, are not enough discussed as well as alternatives. They are presented as just universally given. Uh, it is uh, an elite-driven uh, process. Uh, Duflo underlines the car construction of experiments uh, with uh, governments, with NGO, but it is an elite-driven uh, car construction only with uh, NGO leaders and so on not with the uh, very subject of uh, the experimentation. And the feedback from the field is partly limited uh, by a very pyramidal uh, hierarchical uh, organization in the GPOL. Uh, on the top, you find uh, leading GPOL efforts like Duflo, Banerjee, Kremer, and so on, designing RCTs and uh, publishing their results. They are supervising uh, the research assistants, that's the second category. Uh, research assistants coordinate the RCTs in the field during one uh, or uh, three years. And then you have the local uh, field workers carrying out uh, the uh, experiments. Uh, many project managers come uh, from the north also and from uh, uh, well-known universities. Uh, in the north and the, the local actors are the field workers. Um, so uh, to improve the impact of uh, evaluation ed initiative, uh, an idea would be to create much richer uh, feedback loops between beneficiaries uh, and aid providers and evaluators. Um, the question uh, is then um, that um, a big issue is that randomization is only feasible for a non-random subset of uh, the intervention and settings relevant uh, to uh, development. Uh, they are suited to address uh, tunnel-like issues which are characterized by a clearly defined and stable treatment, a rather short and even proof causal chain and a large share of targeted individuals that are effectively affected by the intervention. The problem is that most development interventions do not satisfy uh, such prerequisites. Uh, so one, one can think of Maslow's uh, famous formula, 
Uh, if all you have is a hammer, uh, everything looks like a nail. Um, and it applies partly to the uh, Jepal or city, uh, amounts to a kind of technical panacea, applied to uh, all kinds of micro issues, empowerment of women, local corruption, health, nutrition, education, credit, entrepreneurship, workforce mobilization, and so on and so on. It's a kind of one technique fits and fixes all uh, issues. Um, and uh, my, my point is that there is not enough soft evidence, and it was already emphasized uh, by uh, Danny Rodrick. Uh, he told that the hard evidence uh, from the randomized evaluation has to be supplemented with lots of soft evidence before it becomes usable. So, uh, for instance, qualitative analysis can help to choose treatment relevant for a uh, local population uh, to identify possible hurdles, misapprehension, deviation from the protocol in the conduct of the experiment and to uncover the motives of behavior of the population and the causal processes behind the outcomes. Uh, there are some attempts to link uh, qualitative and quantitative uh, material in recent uh, experiments, but in practice, the working together of teams uh, with a distinct scientific culture is not easy. Uh, there are many tensions, uh, as exemplified by uh, 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 an RCT in Cambodia. Um, the shared belief in the power of our numbers uniting the Jepal associated uh, with the neglect of other forms of scientificity and evidence is a, a, a practical hindrance to such uh, mixed method endeavors. So uh, now the third part, the historical uh, context. Why this new wave? Why this is not new at all? So uh, I will begin with the immediate historical context and then shift to uh, the longer historical context. And I will show you that there are experimental cycles uh, in uh, public action. So why the contemporary success? There is a, a, a favorable conjecture uh, in the end of the 90s, uh, the so-called post-Washington consensus at this period. Uh, the Millennium Development Goals, uh, with, uh, which contributed to the deletion of development matters into a myriad of micro-objectives. And uh, besides, there was uh, in the economic uh, discipline a trend towards uh, piecemeal analysis. So uh, it began as a niche uh, in the end of the 90s, and it became a very prosperous academic uh, industry. Now let's have a look at the longer uh, historical context. My main point is that uh, the development of RCTs uh, in the 20s uh, um, in uh, social sciences precedes the development of RCTs in agriculture and medicine. So it is, uh, it is not the mainstream history uh, of a transfer from uh, medicine, uh, and I will try to show you that social experiments are thus not new and are not simply derived from medicine. Uh, there was uh, what was called the Experimenting Society uh, Project, which is an autonomous project that has its own socio-political uh, determinants. So there are three waves of uh, uh, RCTs in uh, the 20s uh, till uh, the 1940s. A second wave took place in social sciences uh, in the 60s, 70s, and the third wave uh, uh, from the 90s uh, up to now. Uh, I will just have a look at the first wave. I, I won't detail the other waves. Uh, so the first wave was dominated by uh, psychology. Psychology was really the pioneering discipline. Uh, there was a strong focus on education because, uh, as one of the leaders of the time said, school children, like rats, are docile, are inexpensive, and are plentiful. So there is a high children uh, compliance to the protocol, and it's easy to assign them to, to, to group and to control their behaviors. 
Um, so they were testing, for instance, large versus small classes. So this is very, this is a, a very old issue. Uh, they tested fresh versus uh, ventilated air. They tested different ways of teaching. Uh, so uh, these were a control experiment using not randomization but matching methods to build uh, comparable groups. Uh, the first real uh, randomized control experiment in social sciences took place in uh, Chicago in uh, 1925 uh, uh, and the aim was to enhance the effect of voting rights uh, uh, for uh, newly arrived immigrant groups uh, through an information campaign in their mother tongue. Uh, there were six different uh, groups and there were 6,000 households uh, involved. Uh, so it is exactly the same kind of experiments as uh, the, the experiments we are dealing with now. Of course, the scientific uh, justification and fine statistic uh, precision came later, uh, especially with uh, Ronald Fisher. Um, and uh, there were also a very important experiment during World War II, uh, especially in the uh, Moral Army uh, Division, where there was a, a group of scientists, uh, especially psychologists. Uh, among, among them, uh, there was Donald Campbell, which is a very important figure. And they were testing soldiers' attitudes. For instance, they were tested uh, the movie Why We Fight on uh, the attitude uh, of uh, the, the, the soldiers. So there were, there were many experiments like that uh, during this time. Uh, so there is a strong similarity of topics and methods with uh, contemporary experiments. So when you have a look at these three ways, you can um, a find a cycle of uh, a strong enthusiasm at the beginning among various actors, political, scientific actors, and it, it is then followed by a kind of deception. Uh, the first phase is, is a phase of uh, what uh, Monnier called the triumphing experimental paradigm. It is a conquering uh, period uh, where the experimenting scientist is presented as the neutral objective servant of the experimenting society. Those were the words of uh, Campbell. Uh, it is presented as a new gold standard for social sciences and policy evaluation. And there are really revolutionary expectations in this period. And it's the beginning always of a, a kind of experimental bubble. And then there is a second phase. There is the deception of policymaker because it is very hard uh, to, to draw some policy lessons uh, from experiments or uh, when the results of experiments are available, uh, the minister uh, who drives th them is not anymore uh, uh, in um, a, a minister, and uh, it, 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 so it has no effect, and so on and so on. So there is a deception of policymakers, of uh, also of uh, scientific, of academics, and then there is. Uh, there are RCTs, but more modest RCTs uh, using less intrusive experiments with baby steps and a uh, more modest attitude toward uh, experiments, trying to use uh, ordinary uh, intervention uh, uh, to be less uh, intrusive. intrusive. So uh, there are um, um, special determinants of these cycles. Uh, it is the conjunction of three elements. Uh, the development of social problems, of social issues, uh, calling for new policies. And there is also a concept, uh, a context of public uh, budget rationalization. In all this period, it was the same. In the se uh, 60s, in the 90s, uh, in, fr uh, in France with uh, Hirsch and so on. So y you find the same context. And also, there is an enduring neo or, leo or liberal suspicion about uh, administrative inefficiency. Uh, public expenditures are supposed to be rationally managed, so there is the need for objective and personal proof evidence. So one can ask of uh, 
uh, if uh, history is uh, repeating uh, itself, uh, if you look um, in uh, 1968, it was a MIT PhD student in economics, Heather Ross, that introduced RCTs in economics with the New Jersey income uh, maintenance experiments. It is another MIT uh, female PhD student in economics, Esther Duflo, that contributed to another experimental wave in the 90s. And you have the impression that uh, the, the, they are wiping the slate clean. There is little reference and coarse learning effects from the two preceding waves in economics. There is a kind of new virginity and uh, legitimacy of a method, uh, I'm quoting Lorty and Petit, that has, uh, that has uh, proven its worth in poor countries and should be now transferred to rich countries. Uh, so it's a kind of back to the future. And um, a specialist of uh, evaluation methods, uh, uh, Nick uh, Smith from uh, the Amer American Evaluation Association, said uh, when discussion of the role of experimental design in evaluation became increasingly uh, public a few years ago, I thought, didn't we already settle this? Almost 25 years ago, I organized and moderated a debate at the 1981 joint meeting of the predecessor organization of the American Evaluation Association. The title of the debate was already should the federal government mandate the use of experimental methods in evaluation. So uh, one can ask if it, uh, it is related to an economic discipline that has a memory like a goldfish, a memory span of a uh, few years at most and uh, forgetting just what happened uh, in uh, the past. So the shortest and last parts, so what does it tell us about the current state uh, of uh, economies, um, we will see that uh, the economist is seen as a neutral expert and as a social engineer. Uh, we, uh, I will deal with uh, relationship to uh, other sciences, with internal evolution and struggles inside mainstream economics. And I will ask uh, if is, uh, these new development uh, economics are really about uh, development. So uh, Duflo advocates uh, uh, the Nudge uh, paternalism a la uh, Taller and uh, Sunstein uh, in poor economics and in our first Tanner lecture, which is available online. It's a kind of science-based paternalism. Uh, according to her, a number of outcomes should be uncontroversially desirable and there is a fair amount of scientific evidence for how to achieve them. And for her, it is uh, another uh, paternalism, it is not the same paternalism as the French industrial houses from the 19th uh, century. So the, the, the photo is the, the toilets uh, for men in uh, the Amsterdam airport. Uh, it's too small, but what's in the middle is a bee, so that men aim uh, rightly uh, and leave the toilet in uh, a nice, uh, clean state. Uh, that's one of the most famous examples of nudge paternalism. So, um, furthermore, uh, uh, in this science-based uh, benevolent paternalism, uh, the experimental techniques works as a kind of anti-politics machine. Social goals are predefined and RCT outcomes are supposed to settle ambiguities and conflicts uh, among different groups within the population. And then real world politics, disregarding or sometimes instrumentalizing entities, real world institution, which results from social compromises instead of scientific evidence, are uh, often perceived as external disturbances and constraints uh, by J. Paul Arthurs. Um, Duflo uh, compares the economics to, uh, to a plumbier, understood as a figure of social engineering. She defined the economist as a skilled technician, an, an engineer or a plumber, delivering his technical skills. And um, this view, 
is in close tune with uh, uh, what Foucault described for uh, the economic discipline. Uh, international institutions have promoted a technocratic view of development problems, uh, seeing the economist as a social engineer and the scientific apparatus of economics as a device to solve narrowly uh, defined problems of policy advance. It is a perfect illustration of uh, Foucault's uh, work. And beyond um, Duflo's constant plea for modesty, uh, emphasis on creative trials, she inclines to a kind of technical, mechanistic Weltanschauung. Uh, and she, she uses the image of uh, um, the uh, erector set of, uh, for children called Mecano. Uh, to, to understand uh, society. Um, Duflo uh, also uh, and the Jepal uh, is connected with uh, behavioral uh, psychology and it's, it is typical of uh, interdisciplinarity within the mainstream now which uh, is either connection with behavioral psychology or with uh, neuroeconomics uh, in um, most cases. Uh, it is because of such preconception, uh, together with the tenure of senior JPAL members in top flight economic departments all over the world, that JPAL economics can be labeled as a mainstream. Um, there is also a kind of soft economic imperialism in their work. Uh, of course, it is not at all uh, the Gary Becker neoclassical uh, uh, imperialism relying on the combined assumption of maximizing behavior, market equilibrium, and stable preferences. Uh, Duflo's and uh, Banerjee's approach is very often at odds with neoclassical economics as defined by Becker, uh, by Gary Becker. Uh, and uh, Duflo's universal grammar is rather the RCT technique. Uh, or a peculiar positivist use uh, of uh, this technique, which is embedded in a kind of mainstream habitus uh, with the trust in hard numbers, uh, social engineering, uh, discount of so-called self-methodologies. And she applies this technical grammar to multifarious domains attached to other social sciences. And uh, the problem is that they are uh, not completely, but partly ignoring the, the concepts and methods of other social sciences. They are overlooking decades of accumulated research on social structures and representation governing health, water, adduction, politics, farming system, etc. That's the main problem. They, they, say, oh, they always say, till now there was no robust evidence on the subject so we can discard all was that was uh, previously uh, studied by uh, uh, social sciences so there is a kind of tabula rasa uh, because of that um, they are also in line with the trend towards static statistical empiricism within mainstream economics now they develop what uh, Alain Desrosiers called naive uh, metrological realism, uh, in which quantification is seen as merely mirroring reality within the margin of uh, error and uh, disregarding the uh, convention that are behind uh, statistics. Um, so there is a new trend towards statistical empiricism, empiricism within. Uh, mainstream economics, far from the high theory uh, as associated before with a uh, general equilibrium uh, theory. Uh, and in such work, statistical techniques are viewed as self-sufficient way to do uh, science. And empirical uh, microeconometrics is seen as the revolutionary alternative to the theory-centric macrofortress uh, uh, according to Angrist and Pischke and um, uh, maybe uh, is uh, Duflo uh, quite dissatisfied with standard neoclassical theory but she seems little aware of alternative theories or she seems afraid to cross uh, the mainstream line. 
So our uh, approach remains under-theorized, and the problem is that it impedes the accumulation of experimental knowledge across uh, various experiments, comparing the different uh, results of experiments. You need a theory. And uh, besides, um, Duflo and Banerjee fight against political economy, economy in poor economics. And uh, they embrace a, a, a very peculiar definition of uh, political economy. Political economy, according to them, is the view that politics has primacy over economics. Institutions define and limit the scope of economic policy. So it is a, a struggle within the uh, stream. They are targeting Asimoglu and Robinson. But uh, there is a collateral uh, damage. Because a variety of uh, uh, long-standing and fruitful traditions uh, related to political economy, to uh, the uh, enabling role of institution and the social and political embeddedness of the economy are uh, totally disregarded. Um, so is it really about development? Uh, Duflos's development as the implementation and replication of expert-led fixes to provide basic goods for the poor who are often blinded by their uh, difficult situation. So development has come to mean, uh, as uh, stated by uh, Ajun Chang, uh, poverty reduction, provision of basic needs, uh, individual betterment, etc. That is anything but development uh, in a traditional sense. Uh, so uh, besides, uh, Duflo tends to naturalize the poor and the rich. It is as if they have uh, the poor, uh, there is a unique, there is a rationality for the poor, there is a, 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 s a specific context for, for the poor, which is universal among the category of the poor. And it is endowing with them with a homogeneous atemporal characteristic, and that is problematic for me. Mm -hmm. um, the JPA is close to institutional monocropping and blueprint thinking, uh, and as stated by Chang, doing more of the same thing is not how today's developed countries have uh, become uh, developed. Um, so, as I said before, uh, uh, RCT isol isolates a special action. Uh, but they are not able to grasp the interaction between multiple action. And development is made of non-linear structural processes involving a complex combination of factors, threshold and uh, irreversibility effects, uh, cumulative and circular uh, causation, forwards and backward linkages. Um, so uh, the flow is prone, as I uh, told you, to uh, micro-reductionism, explaining phenomena at one strata in terms of the next lowest level strata. For instance, explaining social phenomena in terms of individual psychological factors like uh, procrastination. So development is reduced to what happens at micro-level with interventions that can be effectively uh, randomized. So sorry for being this long. Uh, I conclude. So there are some risks uh, with RCTs. It is a new fad in development studies, not uh, in economics and in social sciences. And uh, it can have some uh, unintended uh, consequences via uh, funding priorities, uh, can have a crowding out effect on other types of evaluation, other types of uh, political economy uh, approach. A uh, researcher may lose interest in important question, uh, historical, social, institutional, and structural issue that cannot be uh, feasibly uh, explored using RCTs. And uh, there is a tendency towards focus on uh, short-run impact uh, of small projects away from long-run combined sector macro uh, policies. Uh, RCT is a sound technique, but it has a limited relevance. It is incomplete, uh, and uh, it should not be forgotten that it is only evidence of efficiency and not of uh, causality. And therefore, it uh, would be fruitful to combine much more 
uh, quantitative and qualitative uh, approaches, uh, especially uh, economic uh, ethnography, and to complete it with uh, also uh, uh, sectoral and uh, macro uh, uh, political uh, economy. And uh, beside all the uses of our cities are possible, for instance, uh, Connolly from the Campbell uh, collaboration advocates uh, other uses of our cities, a uh, critical realist epistemological foundation for our cities, um, to shift the discourse from what works to uh, more nuanced accounts for of what works, for whom, in what context, and by using mixed methods and by involving uh, the practitioner uh, extensively. So uh, there are some uh, bibliographical references here uh, in English only. There are many more in French, but I only uh, mentioned some uh, key uh, references uh, that are available in, uh, in English. Uh, I strongly adv advise you to read uh, the paper in World Development by Morvan Roux, uh, Guérin, Roche, uh, and Moisseron, uh, uh, which is uh, one of, it is very concrete and it tackles uh, very interesting issues. Thank you very much for uh, your attention. Okay, so thank you, Professor, for your presentation. It was a little bit hard for both of us. Uh, you sent us two uh, two documents. One was one was from Poor Economics, and another was this uh, w uh, qualitative work by Rus et al. in the Moroccan uh, microcredit. Mm -hmm. So we read both of them, and we thought to take an approach where we could compare, not with just uh, the Moroccan study, but overall. Uh, but you covered everything that uh, almost every uh, everything, uh, and I think our presentation is just uh, we are going to go with it the same pattern. Okay, so randomized controlled trials, a brief history. What we want to talk here is how it started. It has a long history, not just uh, uh, 1700 or 1500. It, the history is quite old, the tradition is quite old. Uh, but the first real trial that can be called a trial was done by James Lynn. This guy was a British surgeon uh, in Navy. And he did, like, there was a problem with the scurvy. And if you don't know, and you might know, a scurvy is a problem of bleeding gums. So uh, you have rashes and you bleed. And what this guy did, you can see in the picture that he described, uh, he created groups of 12, there were 12 people, so he created six groups, gave them different interventions, and he found that, okay, if you eat orange and lemons, it works. And then there is a history of use in psychology, like psychologists like Claude Bernard. And then there was this physician, French physician. His name was Pierre Louis. And this guy was one of the first to say that, you know, you need to have comparative groups. And his method was method numeric, which found the basis of clinical trials. And then the first blinded clinical trial was done by a British physician. His name was Austin Bradford Hill. And sometimes he's regarded as the father of clinical trials. This guy did the first clinical trial in Great Britain to show that streptomycin can be used to cure pulmonary tuberculosis. So what is the history? So from medical sciences, people brought it into social sciences. And as Professor already showed you the whole history in the three waves in which it came, we are here concerning only with the third wave, that is RCT in developmental studies. Two, two main proponents, two main schools. In fact, they're the same school, but two main organizations. One is JPAL, two main Faces are Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo of MIT. And the second one is Innovations for Poverty Action Lab. Uh, this is by Dean Carlan at Yale. And Dean Carlan was a student of uh, Esther Duflo. So going forward, what is, a, what is actually this randomized controlled trial? Why are we talking about it? What does it do? First thing, name says it all. It is a randomized controlled trial. It means people are randomized. There are two groups. One group has to be a control to which your intervention is not given, and the another group where the intervention is given. And blinding, very important thing. Blinding is something where the subjects don't know if they receive, when they are receiving the treatment or they are not receiving the treatment. That is the first level of blinding. We call single blinded studies. 
There is a second level of blinding when the researchers who are putting the intervention, they don't know what they are giving. That is the second level of blind blinding. And there can be a third level of blinding where people who analyze, they even don't know what they are analyzing, who received what treatment. Why RCT? Why we should do RCT? Okay. It is the problem of having a counterfactual. We need, suppose we give someone a treatment, but we cannot have the same person not having the treatment. What the best solution to find exactly same person, same who, who can represent uh, the person in terms of age, weight, all the all the characteristics you can think of, social factors, and what it it is a deliberate uh, experimental design. It is not an observational design. The intervention here is deliberate. We know that okay, this is my intervention of uh, interest, and this is what I am putting into the subject. Uh, into the control group and the intervention group and we want to see what is the effect giving controlling for every other thing and we hope that this will control for other factors that we don't observe like confounding for example is it a gold standard it is questionable we will see okay <coughs> so um, this brings us to the eternal debate of whether Aid is effective for growth, uh, growth or reducing poverty. And here we just took the starting point of Duflo in her book, Poor Economics. Basically, she lays out the debate on two sides. On one side, having Jeffrey Sachs with his best-selling book, The End of Poverty, arguing basically that um, there are many countries that are stuck in the poverty trap of disease, political instability, lack of um, access to credit and, uh, and uh, access to capital and technology and the like. Um, and the fact that they don't have a, a large initial investment, that's why they can't invest in these critical areas. And the fact that um, they can't do it because the fact that precisely because they are poor. Uh, so this is where aid, foreign aid comes into the picture. They can fill in the gap, um, it can help them become more productive. It could kickstart a virtual cycle of higher incomes, more investment, and so on. And then it could lead them to, uh, for them to escape that poverty trap. So for Sachs, for Nate is key here. Then on the other side, we have uh, William Easter Easterly from New York University. In his book, The White Man's Burden, he basically argued that A does more um, bad than good um, in the sense that uh, it leads to it undermines and corrupts local institutions, for example, and uh, it, uh, it can create dependence on foreign aid. And uh, for him, uh, basically, there is no poverty trap. Uh, poverty trap is uh, uh, poverty is not a permanent condition. Some countries uh, who used to be poor are now rich, and can go and vice versa. And his argument was, uh, if you let the markets free, if you provide the right incentives, then people could, you know escape their own problems. So uh, who is right? How could it, we settle the debate? So uh, many argue that uh, we need data. Uh, we can't just rely on the abstract to, to figure out who's right and who's not. Uh, so, so many argue that we need data for that. Um, but then the data out there, uh, basically, it's not really that convincing, according to Duflo. You know, um, she's saying that uh, we're relying, like you mentioned, on case studies, anecdotal evidence, um, cross-country regressions don't really provide a clear picture of whether aid is good for growth, eliminates poverty, or whatnot. So um, we need more uh, s scientific evidence to to settle the debate. And this is where the randomistas come in, um, basically claiming that um, this method provides hard scientific evidence uh, of what actually works in the field. And this can in turn guide policy. And this, and this guarantees that the policy is actually backed up by scientific data. Um, they claim that uh, well-established counterfactual and uh, evidence on outcomes helps us address this aid effectiveness question. Um, so basically he's saying, okay, uh, we could try to find different solutions uh, from the bottom up, you know, one experiment at a time using this randomized control trial uh, method. And in fact, it has been a very successful movement. Uh, we can see it as the, as you mentioned your graph also, the number of, of uh, randomized evaluations that J-PAL is involved in across the world, more than 600. Uh, the World Bank, for example, is also implementing a whole bunch of randomized control trials across the world. Um, a bunch of PhD students uh, focusing on development economics are also getting into the field. 
governments are explicitly requesting this type of methodology as well. So in fact, it's a very successful, um, it's, it's a new movement that's swept the field, we can say. And there's been a, a lot of experiments conducted in the fields of mainly health and education, but also, uh, as was previously mentioned, in climate change, governance, wo women's empowerment, microcredit, and access to finance. And the most notable examples include dewarming, which you mentioned. Um, they found out that it actually improves school attendance rates amongst children. And also another one classic example that they use is the use of bed nets, pretty much saying that, okay, it's, pretty, uh, it's very cheap to produce, to distribute them, to train people how to use them. And they were trying to uh, find out which method works best, if either we should give them out for free or we should make people pay for them. And they actually found out, okay, people do not get used to handouts. Um, they actually use, they value. And they found out that if they get them for free, uh, coverage ratio and the prevention of malaria actually uh, um, improve. And then, okay, so here we're gonna explore some, just some of the critiques that are thrown at, at the randomistas. Uh, this, was, this is probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest critique of, of randomized control trials. And um, because it's very narrowly focused and very particular to the local conditions, um, the generalizability to other se settings is never assured. Um, because uh, context changes, the population, the, the conditions, it's also the implementer. Uh, could be uh, could change and that could affect the results of the trial if implemented in another place. Um, also, because the fact that they're too dependent on the local conditions, uh, we could see that they very they're pretty pretty strong in, in internal validity, meaning that the study actually provides credible uh, evidence that there is a causal link between the treatment in question and the outcome you know of interest, but it's it lacks external. Uh, validity. Uh, and one example that, that th this one for example, Deaton uh, uh, makes reference to is the Oportunidades program in Mexico. Uh, it's, it's basically the best known RCT evaluation of a social policy program uh, in the developing world. Uh, th this case is the cash transfer program and where you know families are provided cash in exchange of sending their kids to school and health clinics and all that. And uh, it was widely successful. Um, it was, uh, it, many saw as the reason of why many countries adopted this type of uh, anti-poverty scheme across uh, many countries. And the fact that it was backed up by a randomized evaluation gave more strength to it. Um, but then the very own architect of the program, he warned against the uh, extrapolation of, of uh, or the how this program can be exported to other countries in the sense that we have to take other factors into consideration. For example, the fact that if a country already has an anti-poverty uh, program in place in which the cash transfer doesn't fit, then it wouldn't make sense for that country to adopt it. Or for example, if if um, health clinics are are non-existent, basically, if there's no incentive for for parents to send their kids to, uh, to get uh, regular health checkups if there's not a clinic nearby. Or, or in education also, if, I don't know, some kid in Honduras, for example, has to cross some gang territory to go into a certain local school, I mean, and his life is at risk, that wouldn't work out either. Uh, so there's many other uh, conditions that um, uh, when a specific uh, treatment or specific experiment works, in particular locations can transfer into the to another locale. Um, also, the other critique under the external validity uh, is within the scaling up, and you also m made reference to this. Uh, basically, the, the effects change when when you include more people into inter into the intervention. Uh, the, uh, the randomized trials are all about average effects, so the, f the impact of the first fraction of the population can, would not be the same, for example, the more you add and the more you expand the program. So that doesn't guarantee that the actual results will hold in one place when you actually scale up at the policy level. And lastly, um, again, it was mentioned before, uh, they, they do not answer the, the, the hows and the whys. I mean, randomized control trials, they tell us whether a particular intervention works or not, uh, but uh, the actual usability or how uh, useful it could be to take it to another settings, 
Um, we need the actual hows and whys that the particular intervention worked. I mean, we need to understand the mechanisms that are behind uh, that explain uh, success of a failure, failure of a certain intervention. Um, and which, you know, randomized control trials do not do a pretty good job in that. Um, I'll pass it on. So, coming to this point of distortion of the research agenda, what do I mean? What do we mean when we say that RCTs can distort the re research agenda into the fields of development? First, RCTs, there are only that many things that uh, you can use RCT to. It, it cannot be applied to everything. Sometimes it is not entirely not possible. Sometimes it is difficult, very difficult and very costly. Or there is, it cannot be replicated. Another thing is that RCTs do not generate answers to all policy relevant <coughs> questions, what uh, Xavier was saying before. Like macroeconomic and political economy questions. These are really super, uh, super problem. They, they don't care about it. Uh, the, the random stars don't think about it. And for the things where it is unpractical uh, to apply RCTs, unpractical is like for large infrastructural projects like making roads, making highways, airports, or other things which are which is re relevant for development, uh, including industries. Problem of RCT, but this is even not a problem. In, in fact, Dean Carlan, who is for uh, innovations for poverty action, he says that okay, well, we are not going to use RCT everywhere. We will use RCT where we can. But it is not the case. The problem becomes when RCT, if, if there is no RCT, we will not fund your project. If RCT becomes the gold standard, it becomes the hard evidence, then the research agenda starts shifting. Most of the research, you only make projects where RCT can be applied. It means you only apply to these little projects that is at a, small, a smaller level, like microcredits. But when you go to a bigger level, RCT cannot be applied. So this these topics are completely or might completely get avoided. And then there's this problem of opportunity cost. They, in our city, you can apply only that many, you can try maybe one intervention or different levels of that intervention, but not multiple interventions <coughs> together. So we don't know that what could be the other case in if, if I had used some other intervention. Or it also doesn't talk about this interaction between different between different behaviors uh, into the society because there are different people. Uh, so this is another problem. Okay, uh, another issue that has been uh, questioned when implementing these uh, types of RCTs are the ethics. Uh, so there's the ca conscient notion, right, of treating uh, other people as ends and not barely, uh, merely as means. So obviously, th it has obvious implications to the uh, randomization method um, around the idea that you're actually experimenting on people. Um, so the, the 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 drive behind uh, this methodology is that. Uh, the huge costs that are involved behind these experiments actually are justified by the value of knowledge that is generated by them. Um, but again, this presupposes a certain um, the external validity argument, which, as we've seen, doesn't much hold. Um, and also, I mean, how can you really evaluate whether this the value of knowledge justifies these huge costs? We were talking about they cost around 50000 to f half a million dollars to implement. Um, and also, well, in other things, I mean, these are open to question, open to discussion as well. Sometimes they hold, sometimes not. But uh, also, there's another one of uh, the treat and control group. Why should we prevent uh, a certain group? from acquiring a certain treatment? Uh, is it right to withhold treatment for them, for example, if we know that put there's a potentially life-saving intervention, uh, but because of the sake of the experiment, we don't administer the treatment to them? Um, and as you can see, uh, the cartoon there actually exemplifies that. Um, then also someone should be getting, yeah, if we have ex ante information, right, if someone should be getting the treatment because of ethical reasons or efficacy reasons, um, uh, they should be getting that and they should be prioritizing that instead of, for example, uh, instead of like administering it uh, to the broader population, why not? Also, administer to a specific one if it actually needed, if it's actually needed there. So, so if if the benefits are allocated um, 
randomly in this sense. Uh, there's a misallocation of resources in the sense that uh, you're not treating that particular group that actually needs the treatment. And uh, there's also the issue of their la there's lack of consent from participants in medical trials. Usually you sign the form giving consent that you want to participate, but in these types of social experiments, um, th that is not usually, uh, or there's some entities that that is not the case. You can think of a local government that is strapped of uh, resources, for example, AGO comes in and proposes a certain um, um, intervention and the government official could agree and you can pick the villages, the communities, but then people, the residents wouldn't be entirely knowledgeable of what, uh, that they were actually participating in the experiment. Um, so lack of consent is an issue here. And again, it comes to the fundamental right of somebody to choose if they want to be a part of intervention or not. Uh, okay. So from theory to practice. In theory, our city is a great design. It can solve many problems of confounding. There is like hardly any selection bias. Um, so many things can be controlled, and it is the highest at the highest level in the pyramid of uh, all the observe, like cohort studies, case control studies, and then we have this randomized control trial at the top. But in medical literature, in clinical trials, and this is even uh, it is it, the rigorous. It is uh, the process is very rigorous. The same conduct for reporting uh, is not uh, done in economics uh, studies. This is uh, very much debatable because the risk, uh, it, it poses the risk of having exaggerated treatment effects. And I will talk about deworming here. But also, in, in the book Poor Economics, there is a section where Abhijit Banerjee is discussing, and he's saying that, you see, India has 1.2 billion of people, but Olympic medals in India, they are not even like last 20, 22 years, they have won like 0.94 medal per year. And then they are comparing India with other countries who have less population, you know, more level of power, higher level of poverty, and they are winning more medals. This is an observational bias. This is ecological fallacy. You, this is just, uh, I don't know, you know but this is simply not possible. You cannot compare India like two different countries with very different context. In India, when you are a child, your parents have this thing that study or you will not get a job. And then government, you don't have sports facilities, means sport is not look in that way. And he compares it with China, where you have 800,000 gyms and 3,000 specialized sports centers. People, children are selected when they are child like four years and they go seven, eight hours of training per day. This comparison doesn't hold. Again, m in medical, in theory, it is blinded. Why blinded? Uh, in clinical trials, it is blinded because it doesn't affect the behavior, it shouldn't affect the behavior of the patients and it shouldn't affect the behavior of the people who are intervening who are the researchers. In social sciences, it is, m in most of the cases, it is not possible to do blinding, unless you are giving somebody seeds or things like that. It is not possible. And when it is not possible, it means it changes your behavior to the treatment. And if you are not getting treatment, you know that in a village somewhere nearby, you know, people talk, you know that they got this thing and I'm not getting this thing, it changes your behavior. Uh, and people interact, there can be spillover, then can be substitution effect, which they don't account for, or even they account, they cannot control it. Substitution effect like, okay, I am not giving you bed nets, and I want to see, you know, what happens, but, you know, somebody gave me automas, or like, you know, anti-mosquito repellent. It, it has an effect, I will not get the same amount of, you know, my disease level will re be re reduced. How do you control for that? Very good design, but it is not free of errors. There can be selection bias. People who want to take microcredit loans, they are totally different from people who don't want to take microcredit loans. Substitution bias, I told, and spillover, of course. But then, also it is not possible to discuss individual fates without taking note of the macroeconomic situation, history, culture, politics. These, these things, don't, they don't exist. In the, in the world of randomistas, they don't play any role. Like, you, even in the same country, if you apply to a local place where an NGO conducted it, then it, you go to in the same country, in a different state, where there is a different government, different or government bureaucracy is doing it. I, you don't know, you cannot control for it. And then comes this deworming debate. Very big example, it has been like, this is a movement like they were said, deworm the world. 
No, there is a website, devormtheworld.org. And what, after this study, like global aid, like agencies, every World Bank, everyone is giving money that yes, let's devorm everyone, every child, so that education will improve, people will get, like these children will get more education. To some respect, it is true. But again, it is the matter of exaggerated uh, uh, results. Two people from Columbia University, uh, uh, sorry, London School of Medicine Tropical Hygiene, they did two studies. In 2015, it came out. It was published in one of the pre most presti uh, prestigious journal of epidemiology. The problem was not that it was uh, totally denied by randomistas. The problem was that they started criticizing these people. In research, we develop as long as we have a scope, a room for debate. In this way, they, they started telling them or tweeting them that, you see, you guys, your model will not even hold, uh, will not hold if you, you will not even pass undergraduate econometrics class. So this was their uh, response to uh, these people. And London School is one of the best uh, institute for public health. So our questions to you. Yeah, just to wrap up. Um, so the first one, basically, uh, we've seen that there's a whole pressure from donor organizations uh, to actually implement these types of trials. Uh, so that can this pressure on researchers uh, to design studies um, that increase, sorry. Uh, yeah, the question is basically, like, can it put pressure on the researchers on this, on, to design studies that increases the likelihood of getting a positive result from the interventions? Basically, I don't know, tweaking certain uh, design features or hypotheses or reducing sample size in order to get uh, those positive results that, you know, donors actually want to see. Um, also, do you think uh, do you think that this new way of doing economics is leading to a problem of selection bias, where researchers only select uh, the, the select the problems that best fit the RCT design? Um. And then, uh, do you think it might change the behavior behavior of local NGOs, because local NGOs need money to operate? They depend a lot of them depend on foreign funding. Now, if foreign donor organization says that, see, I'm going to give you money for education, but I'm only going to give you money if you do, if you deliver them books or if you do something else. So, I don't know if what do you think about it. Can it uh, it uh, can these things change their behavior? And at last, isn't it intruding into different other domains, like medicine or public health? Epidemiologist, of course, there should be there should be a conversation, there should be a space for dialogue between different disciplines, but isn't it like the domination of uh, economics and all other fields that whatever we are saying is right because we have the best method. And another thing uh, comes from your, I have another question that comes from your uh, presentation. You were, because when we were researching, we found that all these people are related. Some of, some of them are in Stanford, some of them are in Harvard, some are in MIT, some are at Yale. So they literally control this whole thing. So isn't it like it's, it's kind of a nexus? So just to summarize everything, uh, we think uh, like what uh, Angus Deaton mentioned, that each study has to have its own consideration. No study is complete and could, shouldn't have a unique right over problem solving. So there should be a mixed approach. And gold standard thinking is a magical thinking. It doesn't exist. So, thank you. Should I start? <laughs> First, thank you to you both for this very nice and uh, uh, very clear presentation. Yeah. That's I still have my mic. Um, yeah, it was a very, very nice presentation. Um, so uh, your first question on the pressure on researcher um, uh, to um, uh, find results that uh, confirms that what they are doing is quite nice and so on. Uh, it's not new. Uh, it exists also for other uh, kind of evaluation. Uh, what is uh, maybe more uh, important is uh, publication bias, which is well known in uh, uh, medical sciences. 
uh, you only publish not only but mostly positive results. And for instance, there are uh, studies in oncology that show that 75% of the trials are not uh, published. So it's, uh, they, they called it uh, the tip on, of an information iceberg. So uh, that's a huge bias, sometimes deplored by GPL members themselves. So that, that's, that's a problem related not only to, to GPL, to NGOs who are keen on positive results, but also from uh, the side of uh, reviews and journals. Uh, so, will it change uh, the uh, behavior of local organization? Uh, it seems that it is changing partly the, the behavior of NGO looking for uh, financing because many, as you said, many uh, uh, financing institutions uh, are now making RCT uh, compelling. So, if you want to have access to funds, you have to do RCT beforehand. So, uh, how long will it hold? I don't know. Uh, it's uh, how long will the, the, the experimental bubble hold? Uh, there are many diverse factors. I, I, I can't predict it. Uh, I think uh, it, it will have a strong effect and then it will decrease. Uh, um, so, uh, uh, your third uh, question is on imperialism, but imperialism not towards uh, social sciences, but uh, towards medicine, epidemiology, and so on. So that's really interesting. What I develop in my presentation is uh, this uh, kind of soft economic imperialism towards uh, social sciences, and this is uh, very strong. Uh, towards medicine, they are able to uh, defend themselves. So they are trying, they are uh, in fact dealing with uh, medical subject. Deworming is a medical subject uh, to a great extent. Um, uh, but uh, they have a, a, a very strong and old uh, experience and they are much more cautious than uh, the social sciences uh, randomness. Um, so I, I think they, they can defend themselves, like, uh, as you said, um, the, um, uh, the London School of Medicine uh, studying uh, uh, tropical medicines, they have a huge experience. Um, uh, your fourth uh, remark in question, all these people are uh, related. And you mentioned uh, related within uh, the Ivy League, MIT, and, and so on, but not only. Are, uh, th it's really a, a, an interpersonal network which is very strong. For instance, Dufour and Banerjee uh, live together. Um, the sister uh, of uh, Duflo is uh, directing the sister organization called IPA, Initiative for Poverty Action, that works closely with uh, the Japan. So there are many, many uh, personal and academic links. Yeah, it's a kind of international uh, family business, family enterprise. And um, a, a PhD student of mine, which is uh, doing uh, uh, his uh, dissertation, both in economics and sociology, is studying these networks. And he has wonderful uh, graphics, graphs, and that show who is important and who is related by various kind of uh, relations. So this is a very important uh, topic and uh, it explains also the, the success. And um, uh, as far as uh, the academic sphere is concerned, um, they are getting more and more elite. They were uh, in elite university with uh, elite uh, PhD program, but it's increasing. That's what is showing uh, through uh, is these uh, ongoing studies. So uh, it's, it's quite important what you pointed out. Um, and uh, as far as the fifth uh, remark, uh, what Angus uh, Deaton said, uh, gold standard, uh, that is a magical thinking. I uh, fully agree with that. Um, there is no magic bullet uh, and there is no um, methodological uh, metric bullets in social sciences as well as in natural sciences.
ready to, f to found more and more this kind of uh, this kind of project because as uh, it was said it's very effective you get result you get result quantitative result of the of the um, of the trial and you have also uh, it's effective in the academic and in the donor uh, world um, because of the number of publication and the and the, the noise you can make with with, with that so it's um, there is a, a clear diversion of resource at the French uh, AFD, French Agency of Development, for instance, it's clear. Uh, it's very, it's, it's a gift <laughs> for the donors because uh, usually they, they, they were, uh, uh, in other projects, they are not really sure of what they, are, they will get as a result. So they don't know whether the project will be uh, effective, efficient, and so on. Or any kind of, of development projects are always complicated for social, social reasons, political context, and so on. While in this, uh, in this kind of um, exercise, it, it, the methodology is very, very clear and you, you get a result, yes or not, with a percentage or ratio. And that, so you, you're sure to, to get something considered as valuable uh, from the donor's uh, point of view, which is a very different and much more, uh, uh, you, you have more trust in the results than for other projects, that, that's, that's sure. A and you point also a very important point, which is uh, diversion, diversion of, uh, of research resource or the diversion of the research focus, which move to methodological, methodological uh, problem uh, details uh, more than on the key uh, development issues. Huh? And, and there is very strong incentives in the academic world for, for those who will uh, continue <laughs> in this field, especially in development economics, for sure they will the incentive to, to, to work in this, um, using this methodology will, will increase. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure that uh, uh, the bubble will, uh, will fall down so, so, far, so, so far, so, so soon, be because it, there is a, a big risk that it get combined with a, a new flow of uh, resource for development project, which is often called the financialization of aid or the privatization of aid uh, uh, of development aid uh, through the trust uh, and the, the the charity funds, uh, uh, notably uh, from the U.S. And they are also very keen to uh, spend their money in valuable projects, meaning projects that will give you a clear, understandable uh, result, not on wide development project or less, less clear. So I'm, I, I, I'm afraid that far. I fear that there could be a, a, a connection, a demand, <laughs> a demand of methodology and a su supply. But, well, your turn. <laughs> anyway, please give your name. Um, hello, my name is Esra. And first of all, thank you for your presentation. Um, I think my colleagues made a good point about some ethical considerations about this uh, experiments and I was wondering your opinions on it. I was wondering if uh, control groups are really aware of the aware of the fact that they are kind of in an experiment are they um, told about this situation or is it just an agreement between local governments or and the uh, experimenters. Yeah, thank you. Um, hi, my name is Erika. I just have a question which is more a concern about the point you raised at the very end after their presentation on the publication bias. So you only published those uh, experiments which have strong results. So for the sake of science, is, is there anyone who is addressing the status quo? Is there anyone who is claiming that also those experiments which don't show strong results should be published for a, a scientist to see the, the methodology which has been used, whether it was strong or not, and how it can be improved? Or if we don't want to call it publication, just save these studies in a database which should be 
available and accessible for everyone because I mean otherwise it's just too biased if you only show what what worked it's okay thanks Why? Mm. Um, uh, as far as uh, ethical consideration are, are concerned, uh, in medicine you have uh, ethical um, commission uh, councils with uh, international rules that are uh, quite uh, clear and uh, rigorous. Uh, in practice, there are many deviations, especially, uh, for instance, uh, in uh, Africa, China, and so on, but they are documented. These, the, for instance, the informed consent. Uh, we know that in China, uh, in many cases, it doesn't happen, and so on. And there are these uh, ethical uh, commissions. Uh, in uh, social sciences, it is beginning really slowly. Uh, at first, there was uh, almost nothing, uh, and. Uh, as uh, I asked uh, the JPA, they, they, they told me yeah, we have kind of we have one commission, and uh, I looked up to everywhere in the internet uh, for GPAL Europe and so on. People had no idea that they were in this commission and so on. So it is, um, I think, uh, it is beginning to to develop, but it is really uh, the beginning uh, of that, and um, I think that. Uh, uh, the informed consent is uh, more the exception than the rule um, uh, as far as uh, subject uh, of the experimentation are, are concerned. Um, publication uh, bias. Uh, in, uh, in medicine, there is a strong movement to have a, a systemic uh, registration of uh, trials. Uh, it is hard work uh, uh, in, in medicine because there is a strong industry influence uh, about uh, three or four uh, trials uh, are just financed and conducted by, by the pharmaceutical industry. And they change the design and so on uh, to, 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 have, uh, to get the desired uh, results. Um, so uh, now they are more and more and uh, registering, trying to register all trials and in, in order to publish also the negative results. So it is happening slowly uh, in medicine. Uh, I think in social sciences, uh, it's not the case. Uh, so um, uh, th there are... Uh, small elements towards uh, the registration now. So we, there is a kind of uh, <laughs> gap, but slowly uh, we, the gap w will uh, reduce, uh, I think. Um, Um, hi, my name is Chloe. Um, I just have a question about um, RCTs in general, because you mentioned it mainly in the case of uh, mainstream and neoclassical economics, but I was wondering what about for, uh, ether heterodox economics? Um, is their practices can be can be like considered, and uh, maybe in a different ways, maybe uh, not in medicine because like. The, it raises a lot of um, ethical co concerns, but are there other ways to do uh, RCTs? Uh, I'm just wondering, um, how does it work? When you go to these developing countries, um, what is the reaction of uh, government and um, their local impact uh, on uh, how do we let uh, to um, do these experiments in the countries and uh, compare between countries? And also, um, do you see some kind of network, I don't know, between uh, state or go government? Uh, 
people and uh, sci uh, scientists because um, we heard, uh, for example, some weak studies that uh, were um, that some uh, laws were um, up, um, based on these weak studies and, and not, not including social aspects and so on. So, yes. Uh, thank you uh, for uh, this question. So, um, is it possible to, to practice uh, RCT is, uh, in uh, heterodox uh, labs uh, and so on? Um, I would like that uh, because uh, they are not relevant in many cases, but there are some cases where you can learn a lot from RCT, especially if you uh, combine it uh, with more uh, qualitative uh, methods, with uh, mixed methods. So I, I'm not rejecting at all uh, RCTs. I'm rejecting a scientist way to, to, to practice RCTs. Uh, the problem is that um, heterodox economics is often poor and that uh, there are uh, huge barriers to, to entry, uh, I think. Maybe I'm wrong uh, to, to, to practice uh, RCTs, you need networks, uh, uh, you need reputations, uh, um, uh, you need uh, at first uh, many funds to, to begin to, uh, to do uh, RCTs in, in other ways. So I think that now it is not developing, but maybe in a brighter future with uh, more funds and um, why not? Um, on, on the impact and on the uh, policy implication uh, of uh, RCTs and the connection between uh, scientists and, uh, and the state. Um, in France, there is an interesting case. Uh, it was the, uh, the, the RSA. Um, how could, uh, could I translate it in, uh, in English? Um, It was not. Uh, it was a, a, a control uh, experimentation, but without randomization. Uh, and the point is, it, does, it was uh, totally instrumentalized by the, the, the French uh, instrumentation. So the, the first results uh, sh they show the po a positive uh, results of uh, this measure uh, in the first months. The problem is that uh, a few months later, the results were not uh, positive, not that positive, and they just took the, the first results and say, oh, it is uh, now a scientific evidence, let's translate it uh, into a law. And so it was adopted. It had uh, an effect on uh, a loose, uh, loose ground. So, uh, uh, is, is such things happen uh, all the time, and uh, uh, that's why, um, for instance, uh, Japan members are, are now, oh, uh, you know, the, the states, mm, <laughs> they, they, they are behaving badly, uh, they are not following uh, scientific evidence. There, were, there was also in France um, um, an RCT comparing uh, public... Um, <laughs> uh, like, uh, for, um, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. For job agencies, job agencies uh, and uh, private uh, agencies. And the result was that uh, public agencies were more effective in France than a uh, private one, but it had no effect. But still the interpretation was quite tricky because the public agency told uh, the problem is that we have not uh, the same uh, financial means as the uh, private ones. So uh, we, to compare rightly, we wanted to uh, give more fun to uh, this, this, they created a special uh, 
uh, department, Capverde Entreprise, and uh, so it was not the day-to-day -day public agency, and it would cost a lot. It was effective, but not cost effective. So you can also understand the state, uh, because it would be very costly to uh, develop such a kind uh, of uh, uh, departments everywhere in France. Uh, so it's, it's not that simple. It's not only that uh, policymakers just don't like uh, scientific evidence. Uh, it is the, the, the question, the issue is much more uh, complex in, in practice. Um, I have one question. So my name is Alexi, and I just wanted to ask because you talked about soft imperialism, about other social, social sciences, the fact that those um, studies usually they don't take into account social or qualitative methods. And I have a question which is not directly linked to on, only a random control experiment, but I would like to have your opinion, especially since I think you're quite involved in this topic. Um, do you think? Um, why they don't take this into account? Do you think it's because um, they uh, think it's not useful, it's stupid? Or do you think it is because they just don't know? They have no idea about those uh, methods, they don't know how to use them, they don't know how to read a sociological paper. And uh, no, but I mean, it's, it's a real question, and this is linked to the question, and that's why I said I think you're involved in this, the question of the training of uh, economists uh, in France and related to uh, like PEPS economy in France and ISIP at the world level. So, I mean, do you think this is an example of, uh, <laughs> do you think it's an example of this uh, limits of the training of economists right now or is it just they, they know it but they decide not to use it because for some reason? So, I would like to have your opinion about this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, and I asked myself the same question uh, because I was really astonished because Duflo, uh, as a multidisciplinary uh, 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 training, thank you, uh, she began uh, as an historian. And she knows a lot on sociology and so on. She, so she had a multidisciplinary training. And it is the same for the, uh, the, the French networks uh, within the JPAL. They are quite clever uh, people uh, with uh, uh, interdisciplinary uh, training. So I was asking myself, why is the flow kind of ignoring this wealth of uh, knowledge? And I think there is a tendency, uh, 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 she's really looking for uh, scientific evidence and uh, I think she doesn't like complexity and sh she's looking really for uh, simple answers. And uh, 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 her dad is a mathematician and uh, uh, I think she was disappointed, but it's a kind of hypothesis. It's a, a my bar philosophy. Yeah. I, it's a kind of a hypothesis. Uh, history was much more, was too complex. She began with that and she was looking for uh, a simple, more simple, simple answer and practical uh, uh, answer. Uh, so that's one point. Another point is, uh, uh, that uh, such kind of knowledge, you, you can't um, value that uh, uh, in uh, um, economic publication. And I think that this is really powerful. It would be an in impediment or it would complicate too much uh, the writing of articles to use knowledge from other social sciences. And, you, and then you can have a simple answer. It makes everything more complicated. You have to work with other methods and uh, so the publication units will be uh, less than, uh, I think, so it's, it's a mixed. And for some of the randomista, uh, there is ignorance because they have no training in other social uh, sciences uh, too. But there are some randomista that comes from other social sciences. So, yeah, it's, it's a mix. Maybe you have a better answer. No, but the thing is that when they do, when they do hiring, Japan, mm -hmm. 
they don't only hire uh, they don't only hire people from uh, uh, economics they actually hire people from uh, they actually hire people from other uh, domains uh, like uh, i'm from public health i applied to jpal and i passed two rounds but then i got a psd and i decided not to not to go for it like not to try but they really take people from other different uh, domains but i don't understand that even if they take people what do they do with them the, i think they give them they train them again they have their own i found they like they have their own training material and they train you for particular events and particular hypothesis particular type of model this is what you are supposed to apply in the field so i don't know how it works with them but so it's just And the ones who are publishing are the leading GPAD members, who are mainly economists. That m it is maybe an answer. In addition with, uh, with the discussion, you, you present them uh, as a sect, roughly. <laughs> no, no, as, as a sect. I mean, with an ide ideology, uh, an outcome, a network, solidarity. No, uh, not sure whether it's right. But. And they're working a lot, so they are just uh, inside. So. They are yeah, seeing people that are thinking like them and uh, working uh, a lot. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's maybe another explanation. But the idea itself is a very good idea. Where it works, mm. maybe for little projects and things. Uh, mm. uh, mm. Some are voting with their feet. <laughs> I've had a tough week. Um, would you make more uh, remarks, comments, especially from the back of the room? No. <laughs> Okay, so I think we can uh, thank very much uh, Agnès Labrousse for this very interesting presentation and also the, the discussants, very clever and relevant, and enjoy the new paradigm. Bye.